Hi, I'm Beth Guckenberger, and today was Father's Day, and it was fun to celebrate Todd and all the children that he and I have formed into our family, but I can't help but on a day like Father's Day not spend a few minutes reflecting on the father that I had. Um, it's been more than 20 years now since he's gone to be with the Lord, but uh, his, the stories that I experienced with him and the conversations that he had still have an impact on me now, even all these years later. And I was telling my kids the story that happened to me when I was the age of my youngest son. Um, we had, I had just gotten the license that year and dad and I were on this like kind of daddy daughter date and I was driving his sports car convertible. We were heading out of town with our dilly bars that we had just gotten from Dairy Queen and we were having conversation about everything and nothing. And as we got out towards town, you could see there were all these fences and the cows were leaning against the fences and kind of bowing them out to the road, even though they had all this pasture available to them. And my dad just commented like, that's kind of crazy, those cows, they, why aren't they walking out there in all their grass? And they're, instead they're trying to lean against the fence and they might break through to the road. And I offered up that I just learned in biology about the size of a cow brain and how they have big bodies and little brains. Maybe they just don't know any better. We just observed in silence for another mile or two, and then he offered up kind of quietly, Beth, some days with you, I feel like a fence. And I feel like you're a cow and you're leaning against me. And I'm bowing and bowing towards the road, doing my best to keep you in the pasture. But eventually you could break through. And I looked over at him and I gave him that teenage girl face that like, oh no, here it comes a whole lecture about what happens when I find myself in the consequences of the road. But instead, he spent the rest of our time together talking to me about what life had experienced and given him in the pasture. However, there he'd had things like adventure and joy and meaning and significance and love. And I was like, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And if you who I trust are telling me that's where it's found, then I absolutely would rather be in the pasture than in the road. And I think, I think the very best stories are told in contexts like that. The very best spiritual truths are translated through, through those experiences. And, and Jesus did it all the time. One of my favorite Bible stories is found in Mark, the end of chapter four, end of five. There's the story where Jesus is on the edge of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples and he just points over to a town on top of a cliff on the other side of the sea. And he says, let's go over there to the Decapolis. And the Bible doesn't tell us if the disciples were thinking anything. I mean, they just got in the boat to obey him. But we now know some more about the Decapolis, so we can, we can just make some guesses. Like maybe the disciples were thinking they don't want us over there because those, those folks in that town worship the gods of fertility and wine. Like, will they even receive us? Or I don't want to cross the abyss because in first century Judaism, they would have considered the abyss, the, the, the large bodies of water metaphorical for the abyss because that's where Jonah went when he disobeyed and that's how the whole earth got flooded with Noah and all kinds of examples in their history where large bodies of water represented things to be afraid of, the, the darkness. So maybe they didn't want to cross over that abyss to go over to a town that they don't even know if those people want them to see them or not. But they don't, we don't know any of that. They just obeyed. They got in that boat. They got halfway across that sea, and the sea did to them exactly what the abyss does to any of us that choose to obey God. It kicked itself up in, in their face. In, in that space where they felt the opposition to God's will, they see Jesus teach them exactly what to do. He spoke his words to those waves, and they were still. In the same way today, we have the opportunity to speak God's words against the abyss, and it has to obey. They get over to the other side of that sea, and there on the edge of the Decapolis, Jesus steps out of the boat, it says in chapter 5, verse 1. It doesn't tell us anything about the disciples. He's met there by a man named Legion. Legion was possessed by a legion of demons. He had been left for dead in a graveyard, chained up, cast aside, given up on but broke from those chains and met Jesus there on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus looks over, sees all these pigs. We now know from archeologists that folks worshiping the gods of fertility and wine sacrificed pigs on their altars. That's why they were there. He cast those demons into those pigs. Those pigs went flying into the Sea of Galilee and Legion looks at Jesus free and begs to go with him. Like, I wanna be and go where you're headed. And it says in Mark chapter five, verse 18, that as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus didn't let him. He said instead, go home to your own people. These are the people that had chained him up. 
Go home to your own people. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and he began to tell in Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. And then Jesus gets back in the boat. He crosses back over that abyss and he goes home to Capernaum where he had come from. And the first time, like my head got all the way around that story, I was thinking to myself, he did all that abyss crossing for one person. And it wasn't even like the most strategic person to try to reach in the town of Decapolis. It wasn't the mayor or the captain. It was like the most unwanted, cast off, given up on member of their whole community. And if that's all I knew about Jesus, that would, st that would be enough to compel and propel me and all of us to continue to pursue the cast aside, given up on members of this world. But that's not all we know about the Decapolis. Jesus will pass through it one more time and it says he's met there by a crowd of believers. So already there's some fruit hanging off the tree of this sent, commissioned, new disciple of Jesus. If you Google a little bit about the Decapolis, you'll see there's some archeologists have excavated some plaques that were made for Christian physicians, martyred for giving their services to the poor. 400 years after this story with Jesus, a man named the Bishop of Decapolis penned the Nicene Creed, said this morning of seven continents, there's still good work that came from the, from the investment that Jesus made in one person and I think, as I think about Father's Day and I think about whether we're male or female, whether we're f fathers today or not, like we've got to be telling good truths, spiritual things that are true in the context and the stories of our lives to the people that are important to us. Because the very, very best stories are eternal in nature. They're told 2,000 years later, we're here in awe of what God did through Decapolis, in awe of what God did through a man who was formerly known as Legion. Here I am. 30 years later telling a story about a dad who decided to take a teachable moment and tell me a spiritual truth. May this day be like every other day this year, a day when we intentionally purpose to remember the relationships that God has put in our life and teach biblical truths to the people that we love.